Hi guys, welcome to this video which is going to have a look at what is formed at the electrodes during electrolysis. The first thing before we get started then is to make a note of the fact that we're using inert electrodes here. Inert means unreactive, which means they don't take part in the reaction. So examples of those are graphite and platinum. The first rule that you need to know then, if you're trying to figure out what is produced at the different electrodes, is if you have a molten electrolyte. So for example, lead bromide, which has been melted. The key thing here is if it's molten, you will only have two things, which in this case will be the metal and the non-metal. So for lead bromide, you will have lead and bromine. They're the only two things that can be produced. So the lead bromide will be split into lead and bromide ions. The bromide, which is a cation, will go to the cathode and turn back into lead. And the bromide will move to the anode and turn back into bromine. If you have a solution, however, dissolved in water, it's slightly more complicated. You don't just have the metal and non-metal ions, you also have H plus and OH ions. So for the cation, for example, if you had sodium chloride, you'll have a H plus ion, and you'll also have an Na plus ion in there. And what you've got to be able to do is figure out what is produced. The key is reactivity. So what you need to be able to figure out is which is the more reactive hydrogen or sodium. And the least reactive one is the one that will form. Now the general rule is that if you have Na+, if you have anything in group one, group two, or group three, they are reactive. And in general, they are more reactive than hydrogen. Therefore, it will be the hydrogen that is produced. So in this situation with H+, and Na+, hydrogen is produced because it's the least reactive. If you have something from the transition metals, so for example, copper, Cu2+, that is always going to be less reactive. So anything in the transition metals is less reactive than hydrogen. Therefore, that is the thing that will be formed at the electrode. When it comes to the anions, you will have your non-metal, but you'll also have an OH minus hydroxide ion. So what you've got to be able to figure out is which one is going to form again. So if we look at the example of sodium chloride again, in this case, you're either going to have the OH minus ion going to the anode, or you're going to have the Cl minus ion going to the anode. And the simple way of remembering it is if there is a halide present, that will form first. If not, you'll get oxygen produced. So in this example with sodium chloride, I've got chlorine, that's a halide, therefore that's going to form. My OH minus won't go near it, so chlorine will turn back into Cl2. If I have something that isn't a halide, so for example, SO42 minus sulfate, there's no halide present, therefore the OH minus will go to the electrode and produce oxygen and water. And you will see bubbles of oxygen being produced. Let's have a look at a few examples then. So copper sulfate solution, CuSO4, is copper sulfate dissolved in water. Therefore, if I look at my cathode, I'm either going to have a H plus or Cu2 plus moving to the cathode. What you need to do is remember copper, it's a transition metal, therefore that's my least reactive. So copper ions are going to go to the cathode and turn back into copper. If I look at my anion, I've got SO4, therefore I do not have a halide, so I'm going to have my hydroxide going there. Therefore, I'm going to get oxygen produced. Next example, let's look at sodium chloride, NaCl. Again, it's aqueous, it's in solution. Therefore, I can either have Na plus or H plus produced at the cathode. Look which one's the least reactive. It's going to be hydrogen in this case, because sodium's in group one. Therefore, I will have hydrogen produced H2 at the cathode. If we look at the anode, you're either gonna have chlorine or OH minus. The chloride ion is a halide, therefore chlorine is gonna be produced and we're gonna get Cl2. If we have a look at sodium sulfate solution, Na2SO4, again, you're starting to get the picture now. I've either got Na plus or H plus. Sodium is in group one, therefore it's reactive, so hydrogen will be produced at the cathode. My sulfate is not a halide, Therefore, I will get the hydroxide ion going to the anode, which will produce oxygen and water. So I will see my oxygen bubbles being produced.
And finally, let's have a look at water acidified with sulfuric acid. So I've got H2O and H2SO4. This is exactly the same as something being aqueous. So at my cathode, I can actually only here have H+. There's no metal in there, so there's, the only cation in there is H+. Therefore, I will get hydrogen at the cathode. The anode is exactly the same as we've been doing it. So you look at it, is there a halide there? No, I've either got OH- or SO42-. None of those are halides. Therefore, my OH- will go to the anode and it will produce oxygen bubbles and water. Right, let's see how much you've picked up throughout the video then. So question one, I'd like you to tell me the rules to figure out what is produced at each electrode. Make sure you include how you know what you've got if you've got a molten electrolyte, so something that's just the metal and the non-metal, and what happens if you have an aqueous electrolyte, so your metal, non-metal, and your water. Three marks, one for your molten, two for your aqueous. Question two, what is produced at each electrode when molten lead bromide is electrolyzed? Question three, when you have aqueous potassium chloride. Number four, when you have magnesium sulfate aqueous. And number five, when you have iron sulfate aqueous. Have a look at each one, remember the rules. Remember if it's aqueous, it's gonna have water in there. So that's H plus and OH minus ions. Figure out which is the least reactive for the metal and figure out if it's got a halide in for the non-metal. Use the rules, have a go at the questions and we'll see how you've done in a minute. Okay, let's see how you've done then. So question one is talking about the rules of what is produced at the electrodes. Nice and simply, if you have something that's molten, then you are gonna get just the things there. So you could have put one or the other, the metal or the cation forms at the cathode, or the non-metal or the anion forms at the anode. You could have said either of those, either one would have got you the mark. For the aqueous, obviously you've got slightly different rules. If you have your cathode, you're gonna have the least reactive forming there. So your cation, the least reactive one, will form at the cathode. Your anion will be the one, if it's a halide, that will always form first. If not, you'll get oxygen. If we move on to question two, what is produced at each electrode when molten lead bromide is electrolyzed? So you've got lead bromide, it's molten, so at the cathode you're gonna have lead, and at the anode you're gonna have bromine. Slightly more tricky ones now, so we've got aqueous potassium chloride for question three. Therefore, which one is the least reactive out of potassium and hydrogen? Potassium's in group one, therefore that's more reactive, so you will get hydrogen at the cathode. At the anode, you've got chlorine. Chlorine's a halide, so that's produced. You won't get oxygen. Question four, you've got magnesium sulfate. It's aqueous. Magnesium's in group two, therefore it's reactive, therefore hydrogen will be produced. And your sulfate, there's no halide there, therefore you'll have oxygen and water produced. And then finally, question five, iron sulfate. Iron is in the transition metals, therefore it's unreactive, therefore that will form at the cathode. And similar to question four, you've got a sulfate, therefore oxygen and water will be produced. That's everything for this video. There is a quick set of review questions though, which is to explain why the products of electrolysis of the following electrolytes are different. So molten magnesium chloride and aqueous magnesium chloride. So the first thing you need to do here is tell me what the products will be for both of those and then explain to me using the rules why it's different. And similarly for question two, why are they the same? So you've got molten copper chloride and aqueous copper chloride. Both of them are going to be the same. What is going to be produced and why talking about the rules. That brings this video to an end. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Hi right, guys, hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, click on subscribe, visit the website, and have a look at the latest video. Thanks for watching.